this is a spoiler. You can't listen you know. to this and not have spoilers. Turan, the trouble with being born. It is not a work of fiction. It is also, and you know, it is a philosophical work in a um, in a large sense for me, anyway. Um, it not that boring. It's a book of aphorisms about a lot of things. But anyway, he was born in 1911 in Romania, which at the time I guess was Hungary, Austria. Um, he lived uh, the majority of his life in Paris. Uh, surprisingly, for someone who had saw so much uh, little, uh, you know, worth it in life, he lived to be 84. <laughs> I wrote, poor sap. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he uh, wrote, uh, after a certain point, he wrote everything in French. Uh, and people were very, you know, very impressed with, uh, his writing in French and he basically, and the plot, Laura is, uh, despair, <laughs> nihilism, <laughs> death, suicide, uh, human alienation. Um, and he, you know, the reason that I, that I was saying joyful noise earlier is because despite everything, that you might pull out of this that is so concerned with despair, et cetera. He, there is such an incredible, I don't know, enthusiasm. You know, it, interestingly, you could never convince me that he didn't love life, despite the fact that he was very concerned with despair. Um, and I, I, uh, Daniel actually recommended the book to me and I started reading it and I thought, you know what, I am, I, some, I would like to talk about this book with the group, even though it's not fiction. And, and I would ask, um, uh, if Daniel would want to please, uh, that's, that's it for me in the intro. If Daniel would get, would um, want to give a little more of an intro, then I would be very happy to hear him, what he had to yeah, I hadn't re realized that you'd read the book before, uh, Daniel. Um, you know? Well, I just read it, and I read it uh, maybe earlier this year, I guess, for the first time. And so um, shortly after, I sent a few things to you guys in emails because I just, like Mary, found it delightful. And um, she recommended it for the group. So I'm reading it kind of back-to-back, -back, um, which was great because all of these uh, – ones that I'd highlighted before uh, that were uh, that were good but then going back through uh, maybe other ones that didn't hit me uh, did this time so uh, it was a pleasant experience to return to it again but they, they provoke thought they provoke a lot of reflection sometimes he's frustrating sometimes he's insightful sometimes I disagree sometimes I'm like wow he just he really nailed it pessimistic but like Mary said it, it has a quality I guess why I'm drawn to pessimistic things sometimes is that there's a certain relief, I think, when someone will say what other people have been avoiding saying, but which you feel maybe is true, or at least has an element of truth to it. And if you've been in a situation, uh, for whatever reason, where you've had to sort of stifle that, I think it, it can be really refreshing to hear someone come out and say, well, you know, this is just uh, ruined <laughs> or whatever. So he, he's, he's very eloquent and he's, he's uh, sometimes in, in diagnosing exactly what's going on. Uh, I mean, from his perspective, what's going on in certain social situations or with personal psychology or with philosophy or culture. And um, he's deliberately gloomy and sometimes maybe he's at the wall and maybe they don't stick but um sometimes they do maybe the best way to get into it is just to read a few of them and talk about them yeah 
Yeah, I, I would just add to that that uh, there are times when I get when I'm just really, really tired of the cult of positivity that seems to have overtaken our world. <laughs> like you always have to see the bright side to things. It's a little bit different now that people are, you know, that the the utter horrors of Trump are with us, and that is the last time I will mention Trump the in, for the entire call. I promise. No, um, don't don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, yeah. <laughs> but I do think that it's interesting that we're, you know, I mean, I guess it's just part of the whole things that I that I would normally blame on stuff like helicopter parenting, stuff like that, how getting a trophy for losing a game, that kind of stuff, like everything has to be positive. And I think yeah. that he's a lovely uh, tonic to to let yourself enjoy as you sit back and watch in horror as they put a positive spin on every aspect of life that is just, that is actually truly horrifying. I think you nailed it. I mean, there's a fragility now to things and uh, to social interaction. I think we're, we're extremely sensitive and anxious about offending or damaging each other. And so there is an aversion to any kind of honesty that, might be blended with uh, a negative judgment or a, a negative sort of connotation. You know, I, we're afraid that will do damage to someone or the unwillingness to put yourself at risk by checking someone or by expressing opinion that won't be popular because uh, ostensibly you don't want to hurt their feelings or you don't want to give someone a bad thought. But really, or I think what's going on. That's the big problem. So you're protecting your own feelings under the guise of protecting someone else. Yeah, I heard this thing recently. I hope I can get this right. It's uh, if you tell other people, if you like hide the truth from other people, you're helping yourself. And if you tell people what they need to hear or the truth, then you're helping them. And the way I take that is so often that, you know, we, we don't say the thing and we acquiesce to make it easier to be liked or because you want to appear a certain way. And but that's a, it's a selfish reason. It's like a a lie of not going far enough, and it's not helping anything. Like you would presume, even though that's what the person wants to hear, you're doing them a disservice. Right, and when when they finally when somebody finally is able to gather up the gumption to do something, it just turns out to be incredibly rude. We don't know how to talk anymore in a way that's <laughs> civil yet honest. So well, I, this is all gets into it because I think it's a very existential thing that we're going through. And that's also like the book is incredibly sensitive. I mean, it's about, I mean, being in a very rich way. It, it talks, it gets in there in a way that, um, I mean, it, it reads like it, I'm surprised that it's nonfiction or labeled as such. I get it as a philosophical thing, but I mean, it, it is, it, but it's just, it's really going for it. Well, I mean, the, the range of ideas and uh, talking about, the existence and reality and consciousness in such a complex way. I read that his mother told him that if she knew he was going to be as sad as he was when he was a kid, she said, I would have aborted you. <laughs> Sweet, honest, that's what she said to him. Yeah. And that, no, that's what I read. No, I, I, I read that too. But that he didn't take that in a, you know, he, he actually saw that as something that helped him. So. In what way? I mean, if it, uh, when I read that about him, and then I read the, what he what he wrote, and other things I read about him and what he wrote, it occurred to me that if I think about if my mother had said that to me when I was five or six or seven, whatever, that if I'd known you were going to be as sad as you are, I would have boarded you. And then I turned out to, grew as I grew turned out to have this philosophy that was more pessimistic and darker and nihilistic. It's hard for me not to see a connection there, that the person who gave life to you, and he himself, trouble with being born right there. I mean, it's hard for me not to see a connection there. I mean, I'm sure, I, I, I see what you're saying, that he said that that helped him, but maybe that's because it helped him see the fragility, or not that, but the futility of existence, right? The other thing is that he was already there. He was already there. When yeah. he was five? I don't think that she said it when he was five. I think she said it when he was a little bit older than that. And he had this aspect to his personality. You know, he said a lot of things. He did a lot of things that he later 
Yeah, I know. He was like a fascist or lover or something, right? At one point, he was. Yeah, he supported a, a Hungarian fascism, wrote about it, but then had it deleted from the second edition of the book yeah. that he wrote about it in. And you know, everybody makes mistakes. Oops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, he didn't. He also didn't, you know, he removed it from the book, but he didn't, I don't think that he shied away from talking about it or anything like that. He's an interesting person. He's a very, you know, he's a complex yeah. person. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't perfect. I have a hard time thinking that, that, uh, and, and maybe it's true, but that one comment, if one comment from my mother could get all that brilliance out of me, then pff, I'll take it. Yeah, Go no, ahead. I mean, I'm not saying that. I'm saying about, <laughs> well, I'm thinking about, you know, I, I mean, it depends on how, I mean, you look at the brilliance, you look at the work, you look at the, the way he thought and the way he wrote, and then you think about him living the life that he lived. You think about, I mean, if my mother said, I mean, how could any mother say that to their child? <laughs> I would have aborted you. Mothers and his father was worse. an Orthodox priest. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, so, I mean, the whole thing is just, what a, what a, what a, I mean, it's just freaky situation. <laughs> Well, this kid was born into situations are sort of a malcontent's paradise though right yeah, yeah well yeah and i mean a, i guess so a malcontent who was who was that lyrical that's right. the thing like he wasn't <laughs> truly he couldn't truly have been a malcontent if he dug that hard to be that beautiful to use language that beautiful to say no, things yeah. in that beautiful a way you no, know I what agree. i mean I like he's that mothers that have said that to other kids <laughs> but i understand yeah absolutely this was he was there yeah yeah his his artwork is you know his creation is very close to the bottom right you know uh, like you're saying i think he he works with very he works with dark and difficult themes and he creates with that material and there's, uh, you know, it, it's somewhat distasteful in a way um, if you come at it from a certain direction. But at the same time, I think like you're saying, Mary, there's I have an admiration for some, you know, for that struggle and for the sort of the majesty of being able to take that degree of darkness and difficulty and still create, still have the inner. I mean, he, it's ironic because he talks so much about his ennui and his difficulty in mustering up the energy or the reason or the motivation to do anything. And yet he was so prolific. Yeah, it is. I, I, I'm astounded that he, that he's not more popular. Well, I had never heard of him until Daniel wrote to us about him. And then I got the book and I decided that I got myself down to two pages a day because I loved it so much. I didn't want it to end. And I will admit that I did not like, I, I skipped around as it, as this day got closer and closer because I wanted to feel like I had gone through enough of it that I, you know, could say that I read it, but I left a bunch for myself to still discover because I really, really love it. It's, I, I really enjoy starting my day <laughs> by well, I mean, reading a few of his aphorisms and just being like, wow, like this, this is amazing. All right. Well, then let, let, I want to just say this then what I have here, and this is from, um, well, the national, and I know we want to get to some of these aphorisms uh, before we go too far, but it says here, where is it? Maybe it was from the national or it was from, where is it? The trouble with being born is a collection of aphorisms. An aphorism is a fire without flames, he said. Sioran, is that his, how we're pronouncing him? Sioran? I think it's Chiron. I don't know. Chiron, Chiron. Okay, an aphorism, fire without flames, Sharon says here, understandable that no one tries to warm himself at it. The aphorism is, as Auden said, an aristocratic genre which fits Sharon's position perfectly. There's no more aristocratic position than to equate existence with torment. This is from The Independent, actually. Um, so why should we be interested in the opinions of this eccentric, who is moreover contradictory, perverse, resistant to intellectual theory, and uninterested in questions of semiotics? Because Sjorin Shor actually makes his philosophy perfectly democratic, assimilable by anyone, including Russell's cabbie, who can read a sentence. Sjorin's loathing is genuine, all-inclusive, and yet perversely generous. 
the book's second last second to last aphorism, which I was going to bring up now, is no one has loved the world more than I. And yet if it had been offered to me, even as a child on a platter, I should have shrieked too late, too late, which might be a joke, it says in this article. Only someone so doubtful of the world's fundamental givens can be trusted. His skepticism lights things up like a torch. That's what it's, it's in the Independent in discussing this book. And that's that, that's interesting. The second to last one, he says, no one has loved the world, this world more than I. After this 100, uh, 200 pages of <laughs> nihilistic, dark, deep, incredibly incredible um, of writing, but it's, it's, it's complicated, complex anyway. It is complex, but it's also incredibly insightful. And the and you you find it, I I think that the thing that I found in so much of it is that you you know you can call it pessimistic but there's this longing, you know the the suffering is from the beauty, the beauty yeah. of suffering is from no the beauty? the beauty of the world the beauty of relationship the be, you know you know these things that that fall away that disappoint us there is this incredible potential, and uh, there's, and now I, I'm I have it marked out, but I I don't have it at, you know at the tip of my tongue. But if all you you know if you look at potentiality, the the incredible potential of the world and of living, and if you could have just left it all as potential, then that would have been kinder, basically to, to you know to humanity. It would have been kinder to leave it as potentiality, because as you as you grow and you accomplish some and jettison other potentials you live through them and they are no longer potentials but there yeah. is so much beauty and potential there's so much and there is so much potential beauty in the world and the fact is that he did that he wrote very beautifully so there's yes. that you know there's that potentiality that was actually fulfilled and maybe it left him feeling empty i could imagine that it would well, one of his uh, aphorisms on page 99 is a book is a postponed suicide. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> so, do you, so do you want to start? Like, do you want to just Yeah, yeah, go, I'm sorry. Like, I've, I've already dug it. You guys go ahead, yeah. Daniel, why don't we just go in order? Daniel, if you would start with one. Okay. Um, I'm looking at one and writing it down right now. He says, a mixture of automatism and whim. Man is a robot with defects, a robot out of order. If only he remains so and is not someday put right. I like that one because he gets at something that we were talking about in our Dostoevsky discussion, which is this sort of making a sort of virtue of the irrationality of man, which is so often derided in all kinds of circles these days. <laughs> I mean, I, I read a lot of, um, well, I shouldn't say a lot. I read some uh, sort of cognitive science literature and behavioral economics, and and there's a it's trickled down into the popular literature now as well, uh, the irrationality of man. And, and there's, there's harm that comes from that undoubtedly from our failure to, to adhere to some kind of order and efficiency that would save us all kinds of chaos and turmoil and difficulty and just um, un unforeseen havoc and harm. But at the same time, you can see how that's antithetical to freedom and, and that it's a certain degree of irrationality may require, uh, you know, freedom may require a certain degree of irrationality. It may require that if every right thing can be charted out and uh, made into some sort of efficient automated process that we resist that um, in order to still have any kind of choices. And if we have no, no choices, uh, what are we? What what kind of lives can we have? And and it, I, I don't think uh, Saron would be one to passionately argue for free will. In fact, I'm sure that there's a dozens of uh, uh, aphorisms in this book that you can find that'll that'll take the opposite uh, approach. But I do think that he seemed to, on numerous occasions, uh, he seemed to be passionately on the other side in the sense that he believed strongly in the necessity of feeling free. And uh, he was uh, despondent uh, to have felt um, 
to look into himself and see, you know, nothing there. He, he was constantly searching. It seemed for uh, uh, it's, it's a paradox. I mean, he was looking for a kind of odd, automaticity in the sense that yeah he wanted to escape the prison of self-consciousness which he clearly thought was a prison but at the same time uh he he wanted to see i I think that um there was something there and that it it was you know something you know worth cherishing in in, in life and i mean he, he he clearly appreciated the beauty of life he appreciated beauty in other people and um he just didn't want to he didn't want to make any equivocations about the stakes of life and the stakes of uh, uh, being concerned with life. If that makes any sense. Yeah. It's something that you said in there made me, made me think about the um, kind of the, the tyranny of rationality and how, if you have, if you're being rational about everything, you don't leave the door open for, anything out you know it as if the reason that we have is complete we actually that we understand it and and i think that we close doors for ourselves when we when we think that we have figured something out using only reason you know? mm, that's a better way to put it well isn't that the whole point of philosophy well some philosophies the, the, the point was only reason yeah so mm. that's you know, I think he clearly <laughs> saw philosophy as more of a prison by the end. Yeah, I, I, I read about that. Yeah, and you can see why. I mean, I, I personally feel like I, I sort of uh, I feel a little disenchanted with philosophy these days. I have to say. I mean, I I think perhaps it's my fault for my own naivete coming to it. Uh, maybe as many people initially do, looking for truth and you know the the way to get the answers you know to figure out your life but it seems to me the more i read of it the more i feel that it's it's more like art you know it's creating something rather than digging down to something that was objectively there Mm. when you say you're looking for truth doesn't that mean you're looking for the answer yeah and maybe it was i think that (laughs) yeah i think that i never thought of philosophy as I, I, I guess because when I went, I went to law school and the, you're taught not, not to really look for the answer, to, you're taught to look for the question. I thought that you were taught to look for billable hours. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that does, yeah. For, with, with some lawyers, yeah, that's what they're looking for. But really, <laughs> in order to put in billable hours, you have to win the case. And really to win the case, you have to, have the, you have to know the right question. But anyway. That's the way I. Question. That's the way I look, look, and still do upon philosophy. But anyway, um, is it my turn? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh shoot. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I, I, I'm not gonna go into a, a long <laughs> thing like um, um, uh, Daniel did. Sorry. Um, that's okay. I'm, 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 I'm I cool with it. it. I, it's just um, I I don't have as much good things to say. I mean, as as brilliant. Anyway, fear. Uh, this is my one little thing. Fear is the antidote to boredom. The remedy must be stronger than the disease. And you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I heard. I heard. Um. Fear is the antidote to boredom. The remedy must be stronger than the disease. So if you're looking for a truth, there's one. <laughs> yeah yeah that's true yeah i like that one a lot um oh this was the one, other one let me just say one more i freaking love this line i love this line so much so i was thinking of putting it on my email as my sign off i read i read him for the shipwrecked feeling i get from anything he writes nice i just freaking love that line but anyway, that's another thing I've noticed also, not just that, the content of what he says, and this goes to the lyr- lyricism and to his, the beauty in his writing, is that sometimes, you know, you're not quite sure what he's saying content-wise, but it just, it's like listening to good music. It, it just it just sounds so beautifully, sounds so beautiful. You know what I'm saying? It's not just necessarily the content, but anyway, 
that, that those are my two little aphorisms. This is very this second is very is very lyrical. Yeah. I totally agree with you. By the way, um, I, I think th I, there were many times I had the same experience that I, I wasn't sure what he was getting at or who he was right. referring to, but you just get a little glimmer or a shard of uh, yeah. a perspective. There's something that just lights up in your brain when you read it or, you know, yeah, it's not, you're not sure exactly what the fuck is he saying, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it just sounds so beautiful. Well, I think that with the... Uh... The bit that I chose, uh, it, it might answer a, a little bit of what we're talking about here. This is from page 89. It is always surprising to discover that the great mystics produced so much that they left so many treatises. Undoubtedly, their intention was to celebrate God and nothing else. This is true in part, but only in part. We do not create a body of work without attaching ourselves to it, without subjugating ourselves to it. Writing is the least ascetic of all actions. So you can't be spare in it. You actually have to put passion into it. And if there is no passion, then it doesn't. I mean, I, there's plenty of writing without passion, but I, I found that really heartening. I found that that and also that that it showed me a little bit more. It showed me a little bit more of his hand that he's. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a, a voluptuous activity for him. Yeah, I, I, um, that kind of, I mean, that makes me think of a couple of lines that go down that thread of the importance of writing for him. I mean, I'll save my, you know what, forget it. I'll find another favorite. Um, one of mine was, uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to paraphrase because it's very difficult to jump around in this electronic thing. Um, but it's, uh, <laughs> he, he basically says, don't write anything that, write what you're not able to tell your friends or be prepared to write um, what it is that, you know, is hard to say um, in confidence to people, the, you know, the bear your soul. And he said another thing about writing for gladiators that you should write for people as if there's like no time left, as if someone's going to be reading this and they know that they're going to die. And um, I think that that drives a lot of his like really going for it. I mean, this is, he's not just trying to, lolly about for like chapter after chapter like he's going somewhere hard and each each time he you know makes an observation i think that's a really powerful part of this writing you can really tell his his per he's, he's like invested in this in a way yeah he talks so much about his insomnia about you know having spent a night a sleepless night and then three waking, yeah waking yeah, up I in the morning that. and and you and you feel like there has been some tremendous quaking in his soul and he poured out this line and i doubt very much that he poured out this line as the line came out i feel like he he put a lot of effort into editing and into forming these beautiful lines that are they, they go down so easy despite content they're so they're so rich yeah there's often i just had to keep going in order to get um, in order to read the others uh, that I was left puzzling it out still and others that I slowly I thought was were impermeable and reading it a second time I understood and it was a great you know thought and so there's just richness and what was amazing about this just to kind of harp on a you know that rather than something specific but it's something everything could change on a last word or in the last phrase he could really send it home and then like send, leave you reeling and uh, that kind of like tight writing is something this reminded me a lot of invisible cities um it, it, that there would be moments where everything just um it's like he you were following someone jogging and then all of a sudden they sprinted at you know uh, at the very end and it was just incredible you couldn't take anything for granted there was so much there in every word yeah yeah i think that's right they're very poetic he it's deceptive because it is very philosophical, uh, but he's committed to uh, a, a coherent and well, coherent maybe the wrong word, but he's he's committed to a plain language sort of um, uh, very communicable approach. He's committed to not using jargon, not obscuring, uh, not um, putting things into the kind of language that's going to be so vague and abstract and suggestive that perhaps critics could trouble over it endlessly, but the common person is going to get nothing from it. 
Um, he didn't like that at all. And he didn't write like that. And so you definitely, you can go over these and some you can really sink your teeth into and stay with for a very long time, but you can also always get some impression from them very immediately. Yeah. Yeah. I had a feeling that he was um, likely troubled by a lot of the philosophic reading that he did in school. I think that he, (laughs) I think that he remained a doctoral candidate for 10 years or, you know, longer. (laughs) Um, and wanted to make his feelings clear. And I like that. I do, I do have to say that I like that kind of clear speech, but also it's clear speech that you can, you can get the, you know, you can get the surface bit. And then if you dig down deeper, as you were saying, you can, there's real, there's meat under there. There's meat on them bones. (laughs) <laughs> yeah there's there's some very subtle philosophical ideas contained in here sometimes and if you're used to reading the other kind of philosophy um uh, very jargon riddled sort of continental philosophy where you you really have to have a long prerequisite reading list uh under your belt well digested and understood in order to come at it and get the new ideas out um, he he definitely was not a fan of that, and he he says so explicitly in interviews I've read. But you can get it easily just through this. But you would be it would be remiss to think then that because of that, this stuff is really just like child's play. It's it's shallow. It's not at all. Yeah. Let's have your next one, Daniel. Um, okay. Well, this gets back to sort of what we were talking about about law and philosophy a minute ago. How about uh, We cannot do without the notion of progress, yet it does not deserve our attention. It is like the meaning of life. Life must have one, but is there any which does not turn out upon examination to be ludicrous? Uh, So I'm sorry, would you just, would you read that again? Yeah, sure. I want to hear that again. We cannot do without the notion of progress, yet it does not deserve our attention. It is like the meaning of life. Life must have one, but is there any which does not turn out upon examination to be ludicrous? Hmm. So I think, I I think no one of those that's sort of um, after a, a reading or two, it gives me a different impression because I think rather than what just shitting on progress, on? it uh, I couldn't tell you. It's an 81% of my Kindle. Oh, you're on a Kindle. All right. Yeah. But I think it sounds at first like he's just kind of deriding progress, but maybe it's more that he's saying that progress or meaning is something that can only sort of fuel us obliquely then we turn our attention to it and it sort of crumbles under inspection it crumbles underneath uh, the scrutiny of consciousness because and this goes to a common theme with him consciousness is something that just sort of disintegrates everything but uh, an unconscious force um, can can motivate us it can really propel us uh, i think he celebrates that in a lot of these aphorisms, the, um, the ability of uh, drives and emotions and sort of unreflected activity and action, you know, to, to give mankind the motivation and the ability to live um, happily and in, in an engrossed kind of way. But he sets that up as the foil. Uh, he sets up consciousness as the foil to that. And um, direct attention, it seems like for him, is the thing that he can't escape from. He can't uh, he can't escape from this introspection, <laughs> and it it sort of uh, annihilates the motivation to do anything. And he's constantly sort of lamenting his inability to stop scrutinizing his entire life and existence. Yeah, he says a couple of interesting things about consciousness uh, and f- regarding fear. Like one was. Uh, something to the effect that like consciousness springs from fear or um, um, and a morbid fear. He later on clarifies in another thing. He says a morbid fear rather than a natural fear. Otherwise, um, animals would have like the most acute sense. He's trying to make a distinction that there's a special kind of morbidity to the consciousness that's um, or to the fear which generates the consciousness. And um, he 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 also talks about yeah that kind of that uh consciousness begins with something like a muted action by not taking by not 
going forward with something you it like internalizes and it, it, it kicks around and he makes it seem like this kind of like oh and there was another one that was uh that like the body used consciousness to like replenish itself or like the cries of the body would get answered by consciousness and it would spring forward kind of like a servant not knowing what it was called for or what it was really to do and then it would be kind of like hanging around afterwards without any real purpose and uh so his view of consciousness is something, you know, uh, kind of like, I don't know, uh, it, it's hard. I mean, it's, I, I don't want to oversimplify it uh, because, I, you know, it, it's, I think it's something that's very, uh, that's very crucial in this, uh, throughout all these stories. But it's something like a historical perspective about civilization that he takes pretty much the same approach with. Um, so he, he basically thinks that the West is declining under the thrall of reason and consciousness in the same way that it's sort of bedeviled his own life. Um, did you guys get that sense? I did. I did. Mm -hmm. I got the idea that we're basic, our civilization right now is kind of the, the personification of awake at, at 3 a.m. with a troubling thought. <laughs> isn't this, isn't this, is this like I mean he was very um, big into political philosophy right I'm asking I don't know I think that he's, he, he certainly read, stopped writing about it after his after his, uh, his brief romance with, with the far right yeah. <laughs> yeah ultra far right yeah I don't know I read something about that yeah, it was interesting to hear the the time frame around this. I didn't do any of that research, um, you know, because I wondered, you know, where the intellectual thought was at this time. You know, <laughs> Nietzsche quite a bit. Um, yeah, All right. I think yeah, this was yeah. written in 1972. Mm. I'm not sure. Or it was published in 1972. It was probably written for 50 years before that. There was one thing that I wanted to say about uh, what we were talking about a little bit earlier and I think that one of the reasons that I enjoy him so much is that I tend to like writing and ideas that are somewhat open-ended, that allow me to use my imagination to interpret them. I would rather not have a code of written laws that say exactly what this person thinks and believes mm -hmm. And so, interestingly, the simple, the, the the simple way that you can take a lot of his aphorisms is the you know the tip of the iceberg, and that you can you know as Daniel was saying is that you can dig so much deeper. And to me, I think that that's I mean there have been any number of days where you know three hours later I go oh right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel this too. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that was, yeah. uh, I think that kind of goes into what Laura mentioned about, uh, law and the question. I, I heard somebody say, and I, I can't really get the phrase exactly right, but like the, the novel is the question that the book is about answering. It's not exactly the hard, like you're saying, Mary, the hard answer of like, this is now ta-da, what they believe. Right, um, but rather a, a pursuit for something. Ellie, no, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm yelling sorry. at my dog again. Yeah, Ellie, yeah, don't yeah, do yeah. That. yeah. For a second, I thought that I uh, I touched on some kind of wrong. philosophical nerve. <laughs> ah! um, <laughs> Watch out for that newspaper across the snout, Nate. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I won't talk about the boundary of artists. Yeah. Okay, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> uh, but, you know, with like with something like this that is, I guess, explicitly nonfiction, we we see a little bit closer the boundary. I, I, I that's just going to your uh, point, Mary, about, um, you know, seeing uh, somebody like really I mean, he goes for it in these uh, him and he's and sometimes it's just a lingering thought and you're able to go one step further because he brought you to the edge or put you in the realm of this idea and now it's up to you to like play in the space of it. That's how I felt about it. I thought it was an exploration and I could see the exploration in the writing. Um, uh, sometimes it would be, you know, a little tell like, 
he would say, I just wrote the word this and then have a, a thought about it. Um, and so you could see how these were the little adventures of his own mind and they're not wrapped up or, and some of them are self-contained. I mean, or they, they are like a diamond, you know, sometimes they just can cut in a particular way, but others are a lot more uh, notional or speculative. Here's a good thing that goes to that a little bit. He says, a writer has not left his mark on us because we have read him a great deal, but because we have thought of him more than is warranted. I have not frequented Baudelaire or Pascal particularly, but I have not stopped thinking of their miseries, which have accompanied me everywhere as, faithful, as faithfully as my own. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I think he's companionable in the same kind of way. Um, I was just thinking that, that you take him with you. Like he takes you with him on this, you know, horrifying <laughs> journey that he's having or this very deeply felt journey that he's having and allows you to to examine those feelings of your own, but doesn't make you do anything, doesn't force you to believe. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated that. I, I appreciate it still. I mean, I really appreciate the idea that he's – you know, I know that if you sat down and talked with him about any one of these lines, if you came away with something different than he did, he wouldn't slap you on the wrist for it. He wouldn't say that you were wrong. He would probably just want to explore what you what had come from you. Because it's all, you know, him, I think but he was, a, you know, his, his ideas of existentialism lets you have your own. Okay, I, have a, I want to say this. The top of this page, the first aphorism, one line is rather in a gutter than on a pedestal. Yes, which I wrote to okay. Cesare this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good then, one. And then I go three down, and it's existence equals torment. The equation seems obvious to me, but not to one of my friends. How to convince him? I cannot lend him my sensations, yet only they would have the power to persuade him, to give him that additional dose of ill-being he has so insistently asked for all this time. And then, another, a few aphorisms down, one line, not yet to have digested the affront of being born. So what do those mean to you? This guy doesn't want to be alive. You know, I don't know. I get that. I get that despair, like that despair from David Foster Wallace about never, you know, when no matter how much you love someone, you can never be in their skin. And there is a there's a horror to that. There's a horror to, to, to not what not being in someone's skin to not being able to truly understand to never being able to know what someone else is feeling. To you know, to never well, have I mean, any, the the same experience that someone's having. Yeah, here's, and here's not to be able to understand it. Sorry. Exactly what you're saying. I think um, he says in a work of psychiatry, only the patient's remarks interest me. In a work of criticism, only the quotations. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. I have had that experience myself. Well, I think he's saying just what you're saying. There's an, there's a certain invalidity to the commentary on experience um, as opposed to the experience okay. itself. And we're, we're buried in commentary today. Yeah, but we're also the dialogue. In. Isn't that part of the dialogue? The movement of the dialogue. I mean, yeah, you get criticisms of whatever, of experience, whatever, but that's, that's not necessarily right. It's not necessarily wrong. It's just part of the dialogue. The movement, but is it dialogue? Is it dialogue? Is it dialogue well, it when be. someone writes be. a book of criticism about someone else's writing so long ago? I mean, that doesn't seem to me that it, it is actually a dialogue. It seems no, like two it, monologues. It may be two monologues, but they're monologues to be commented on by you and by me and by Mary and by Nathan. I mean, it's not. It's not the answer. Like that's why. I guess I'm going back to that whole point of that it's all a question. Question is like, to me, open at the end, which is what a lot of what he's doing here is open at the end. Yeah, I think that you're, I mean, there's, 
think that you're just saying you're just agreeing with what we're saying, right? Well, yeah. I mean, that okay. it's <laughs> I you said like, no, I but. am absolutely. I am. But okay. at the same time, I'm 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 just talking with Nathan about what he's saying about criticism and that he's disparaging that there is this criticism on right on a writer on a given book or whatever. Um, and and what I'm th- saying is that a criticism is that person's or being's, um, I guess, a uh, per- perspective. Uh, comment it's not the quote unquote answer it invites even if he doesn't want, he or she doesn't think they're inviting but actually they are inviting um us to co- comment on their criticism it's like it's a, a whole move that's why i keep thinking about it, excuse me in terms of movement it's not like it's a period to the sentence you know what i'm saying what yeah, I'm, no matter I'm how much they'd like you to think it was. <laughs> exactly. Right. exactly. As much as you'd like, they'd like me to think it is. I, I don't see it that way at all. Yeah. Well, but I have a couple questions about that, though. I mean, for, first, I think um, we're assuming the priority of a, a sort of collective approach to this communication. But frankly, I think that there are a lot of aspects in which it's simply masturbatory. <laughs> um, I think what, what the masturbation is actually one of the phenomena that I think extends far beyond the sphere we normally give it credit to, but it, it's actually a part of a lot of things that we do. We do for self-gratification and they exist socially under the guise of um, being uh, a contribution or something like that. But what we actually do in a lot of social situations is team up together and allow each other to basically satisfy ourselves by listening to ourselves talk. And I think criticism a lot of times uh, actually is that, Um, especially today in the sort of institutionalized academic sort of way that um, people are sort of propelled to speak and to make a contribution to the existing body of knowledge on a given subject or whatever um there's a real question whether any of that is necessary uh read or uh interesting to anyone or really useful in any any kind of way or is is it just this sort of system of production spiraled out of control and i mean this is one of the things i think that makes philosophy difficult to read these days is that there's this overabundance of it, you know, this manufacturer of knowledge. uh, And um, it's sort of hard not to question the motivations of that sometimes and say, is it would be nice if there was some, some way for people to stay in academia without having to do that. (laughs) Yeah. But you really only follow what was interesting to them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I agree that, that maybe we don't need as, as uh, much writing as we have. Although I have to, I have to say that yesterday, as I was reading, it did occur to me as like I would really like to to uh, read some of uh, his thoughts on masturbation, like on sexuality <laughs> and on masturbation, because I think that when you brought that up, I was like, yeah, right. Like it would kind of be, it would be fitting to have something, that to have him have said something ab- about it. Um, He's and I thought, oh, okay. Silent on sex. Sorry. He's curiously silent on that. Yeah. Sex in general. Yeah, probably, probably the time, and and he had you know manners. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny when you see someone who is otherwise so iconoclastic um, have nothing to say on such a huge yeah. domain of. Yeah. Well, I wonder because when we talked about the beast in the funny. jungle. I mean, there there was this uh, autobiographical note that came up, you know, like, you know, he was a tormented virgin or something, you know, uh, like that. He was, you know, never uh, had this intimacy and you could kind of see it, you know, acutely and how he, you know, um, worried over uh, sexuality and uh, other human intimacy and things like that. And so, yeah, I thought that it was absent, you know, here too. And um, Well, he didn't have it really in, in his life, Henry James. But Sharon did have a um, 
life yeah. a lifelong or lifetime you know life right. companion yeah. um maybe he didn't want to criticize it then <laughs> <laughs> standard good graces i think you're right i think it was the time yeah yes indeed who's next i think mary's next again i have to admit that i had a few things that came up this morning and i meant to actually like sit down and pick pick some I have uh, post-it notes that, like, I cut it, cut up a post-it notepad, and I started sticking them in the various ones that I thought um, that I loved, and I think I have about a hundred sticking out of the book. So I am just opening hmm. to any Anywhere. one of them, and I have no, you know, prepared thoughts on this. Okay. Um, since we remember clearly only our ordeals, it is ultimately the sick, the persecuted, the victims in every realm who will have lived to the best advantage. The others, the lucky ones, have a life, of course, but not the memory of a life. Mm. Mm. So if you haven't suffered, you have nothing to remember. Yeah, that, that speaks that, to the way that suffering sort of instigates awareness and consciousness. And mm -hmm. when you're very involved and happy and really enjoying yourself, you sort of lose time. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. And that gets back to, you know, uh, again, this theme of how consciousness is generated, you know, um, in his view as some kind of like agitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, if I have one more, if, I, if you don't mind that I just opened to that I think is <laughs> hilarious. It's page 165. Beware of euphemisms. They aggravate the horror they are supposed to disguise, to use, as the French do, the disappeared instead of the deceased or the dead man. Seems to me preposterous, even insane. Hmm. Could you read that one more time? I'm sorry. Sure. But uh, the, the first I feel like is very important. Beware of euphemisms. They aggravate the horror they are supposed to disguise. Mm. To use, as the French do, the disappeared instead of the de deceased or the dead man seems to me preposterous, even insane. Mm, yeah. I like the one under that, too, when man forgets he's mortal. Yeah. See that? Yeah. That's a good one. Um, and I, I like the idea that um, he's talking about uh, beware of veiled language. Beware of yeah. the thing that you're trying to hide in what you say so pleasantly or even so unpleasantly. Um, but don't hide, you know, don't hide behind pretty words, which I think is interesting because there are so many pretty words in here. <laughs> um, not that I think he speaks euphemistically very much. Um, I'm wondering, is that, is he saying that he sees that sort of as putting the sheep's clothing on the wolf through language? Like you're obscuring gravity or the truth of something or, or the real character of something through language, but the padding is sort of like, uh, is throwing a camouflage on your own enemy on the occasion or... or potentially yeah and also the feeling that goes along with it i mean you, you calling someone that disappeared instead of the dead is that you, you know you're you're saying you know you're you're adding you're adding a little bit to the mystery he disappeared we all know he didn't disappear he died <laughs> yeah what is that it's a it's a maybe it's sort of like what we were talking about earlier it's the risk aversion it's uh the the fear of being vulnerable in front of others and so we pad our language or mm -hmm. maybe to ourselves as well hmm. well it seems like there's like a twofold i mean if you if you're if you hear that then it has the chance to generate this kind of like uh world that doesn't have the the reality to it like if you're not you know i'm thinking of a child hearing you know like disappeared oh where'd they disappear to it's like oh well they gone away they went to heaven you know what i mean or those those little things can abstract it but for someone else who knows what the loss means and that there you know really was you know death or has seen it you know before it can come to be a palliative maybe by not bringing it to mind you know and so mm -hmm. one on the one hand you're saving yourself but on the other hand it's a weakening 
um, potentially. Yeah. And maybe if you're, you know, if maybe you're only ever going to go one level down. So if I say the disappeared, you're going to think the dead man and you're not going to go any deeper than that. And there's this kind of mysticism involved in that, that doesn't, that doesn't go any further, but the true, the true mystery is in the death. It's not in the disappearance. You know, it, it's not in the euphemism. If you don't go there, then you're never going to actually get to the mystery. Yeah. So I, uh, so I've got a line. I think it's my turn. And um, I think it's. This, I think it's line. always your turn, Nathan. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is philosophy in the morgue. Um, so this is a woman, uh, him and this woman in a morgue talking, and uh, it's his friend that's dead and the mother. And this is what the mother says, uh, or not the mother, but um, the matron. Anyway, my nephew was obviously a failure. If he had succeeded in making something of himself, he would have had a different ending than this. You know, madam, I replied, whether one succeeds or not comes down to the same thing. You're right, she said after a few seconds thought. And this uh, acquiescence, this unexpected acquiescence was um, moving. So, I mean, I think that what he's getting at there is, I think that he's stunned in the first place by that he met, that his point made it through. I, I think that he didn't expect to, to change her mind uh, so much. And it gets down to this... Um, life and death thing that, that, that this is kind of going to possibility. And then also um, a lot of the things that he says that I'd like to get to, which are about before you were born, where you come from and afterwards. And, and this idea of, um, you know, a, like a timeless space or a potential space. Um, I really, I really like that line because he was surprised that he had made a connection with somebody else or maybe, you know, uh, he thought that they would be a little bit more hard one to accept his view, um, but it just cut right through everything and uh, even her grief. Um, yeah, I like that one. Who's next? Is it me? Um, I'm going to do two here, I think, that are kind of related. How about this? Um, for the man who has gotten the nasty habit of unmasking appearances, event and misunderstanding are synonyms. Essential is to throw the game, to admit one is defeated. And then let's go to the next one here. To think is to undermine, to undermine oneself. Action involves fewer risks, for it fills the interval between things and ourselves, where reflection dangerously widens it. So long as I give myself up to physical exercise, manual labor, I am happy, fulfilled. Once I stop, I am seized by dizziness and can think of nothing but giving up for good. Yeah, that goes to that whole um, idea of being and, you know, how uh, it's almost at, at an odds with consciousness, um, you know, mm -hmm. that, that consciousness is in, uh, what, what does he say at one point, a, like a, it's like a post history or it's an after the fact. Um, and what we, whenever, like we get into the process of, we're, we're like removing ourselves with each thought and with each memory from the actual thing and actually being or doing something. Uh, like they're you know being physical um, or in other places just having like um, maybe primary motivations um, you know that that's that's completely different than like the the after the fact thinking of it and using the memories to interchange and you know have hypotheticals and stuff like that yeah and I think about it I wonder, I mean, we, we can't really get outside of our moment in history to know what subjectivity was like at another time or in another area, era or how human beings and human consciousness sort of worked itself out. And he, it may be that he's sort of being, well, I think he's being a little hyperbolic, um, as he often is about this kind of thing, but maybe it's to make a point, you know, it's in the service of something that's not said so often. Um, because in the sort of philosophical circles where he moved, you know, it, the examined life is so prized. Um, and as of the virtues of action and, and unconsciousness and, um, and the fact that that still has, it's still a part of our existence. And, I, you know, how different are we in this time in which we live 
than the way people have lived before, like I was getting to a minute ago, is that we have so much historical baggage that we carry around with us now. You know, all of the information about the world is happening all the time. We're assaulted with it. All of our personal baggage, you know, our lives you know, and the people that we've known and cared about and all of that wants us and we have to bring it to bear on our lives going forward, even as it accumulates and we can't possibly contain it all. And yet then, you know, because of requirements and obligations and things that we have to do, we have to act we're still responsible for bringing it to bear or not bringing it to bear on any consideration that we have to face in life. And it's sort of a tragic situation, isn't it? I mean, you know, there's no way that we can juggle it all. And, and, and at the same time that, that history, it kind of, an, it kind of gangs up on your single little particular perspective on the world. And, you know, to be aware of all of these other points out there, these other, perspectives on things and to have to try to anticipate them it just sort of I think he's saying that the awareness of that it just sort of uh, annihilates consciousness and, and we're often in that position today where because we're communicating so generally now we we have to stop and sort of censor ourselves and try to anticipate all of the ways in which our communication and our actions affect other people and there's a sort of um, involved in that process because inevitably what happens is that your own perspective on things is sort of invalidated because it can't stand up to the horde of <laughs> what you're going to be communicating with inevitably. Yeah, doesn't that go back to that quote about the future or the, uh, the, hist like the length of history going forward or progress? That's what it was. And, you know, like in the face of that, you're just, you know, uh, this little – like moment you can just be washed out looking in like the forward you know if, if you're only living for you know your interplay with a objective thing then that objective thing is going to you know outpace you at some point and but you're still left with um you know yourself uh, i think <laughs> what am i to think what am i to do after lunch who is that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is a there there is that idea though of action and then uh, consciousness, and I I always think uh, after you know you go somewhere let's say you go on vacation I'm always struck afterward by there was this however long anticipation of going and planning what will you do and then you're there mm -hmm. and then you get back and. I always think when I get back, it could have just been a dream. Like for all that I have of it now, I might have dreamt it and and retained what I retain from it, the things that I saw, the things that I did. And there is that in, in that, I think, <clears throat> you know, in pulling us away from our animal nature, from going from, you know, the action being our animal nature and contemplation being our, you know, consciousness being our human nature. It, it is torment. There is, you know, <laughs> that you're going to, you know, it, that you're going to examine it, that you're going to do something and then have to think about it afterward. And, or maybe not, but the, the <laughs> idea that you can, that you have, action and then contemplation of that action is a very, you know, and also anticipation of that action, which I think Nathan goes to the idea of your time before birth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, Cause I think that this is a very interesting realm that he plays around with and yeah, I, I'd like to get, I'd like to <laughs> yeah, anyway. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad that we're, we're talking about that because this is, um, I mean, yes, yeah, so we've talked a little bit about how ideas po uh, are the antecedent or I'm, I'm trying to get after the fact of the body. And then we start living in this kind of uh, dimension of remove uh, each time we, we think about stuff and we and, and then also there's this thing about action. I've got this one right here. Whereas any sentence one has to write requires a pretense of invention. It takes little enough attention to enter into a text, even a difficult one. To scribble a postcard comes closer to sincere creativity or creative activity 
than to read the phenomenology of mind. So I think what he's saying there is that even something putting yourself out there is this big creative uh, move. It's the you know it's this it's this uh, really um, a bold gesture even uh, compared to something which is just taking things in like reading would be, um, which you know is creative in its own way, but it doesn't ask of you to create. And this idea of you know. Uh, because we have on we have like a couple of axes, you know, like we're creating, we're feeling it, we're satisfying something, you know, that we're not even very aware of, you know, like this is the the body getting the mind up to get it food, and you know it's all a motivation, you know, and it might all be like based out of fear. I think is what he's trying to say, rather than a fear motivated of death, it's motivated like a birth fear, and I'm not sure I understand this birth fear. Um, so, well, I mean, I, I remember when I, we first I started looking into this, I remember how I've always said that when we give birth, we're giving death at the same time. So I think what he's looking at is that, that, that the tragedy of birth, you, you see? So he's, I think he's making yeah, an assumption this, uh... that that which existed before birth is not a tragedy. Theoretically, I think he says something about that exactly. Like we we think about the life that we could lose because we wouldn't be a part of the world any longer, but we don't think about the life that wasn't here whenever we weren't here. You know, we don't think about the world before us, but we think about the world after we're gone. And he said, and but okay, now I'm remembering this. Uh, but he says that there's a difference because. In the second place, having been born, you have an identity or a self to lose, um, which is connected to the world around you. So, and I think that he laments getting a self or an identity, um, or creeping into the world by you know crawling into existence, and you know, um, and and thinking about that before time, like just before you were there. And that's an interesting thing that he's trying to draw a line of like where he came into being at you know at what point was the first moment and then also what's interesting he brings up is what's the first moment that something came out of nothing like when did existence crawl into being i think is you know paraphrasing here yeah yeah i think that's right i am um, there is uh I don't know if it's if it's just you know new age or some you know offshoot of Buddhism that you know we're just there is soul there is you know whatever there is being and you have being you are part of being and you are and you split away from that to be born and in that you consciously lose on purpose you lose your uh, knowledge of <clears throat> of of what existed before, and you come in with a blank slate, so that you can have pure experience, and then you go out. And when you go out, you you know you rejoin the the mass. You rejoin that whatever energy or soul or whatever you want to call it. And um, there were times when I was reading this when he was talking about the time before you're born. That I thought a lot about that, and I thought he's probably not thinking about this at all. But it is an interesting thing to think about. You know, if you if you made some sort of choice to come in and live, you know, be born of your parents, and you know, and have experiences that are that are pure experiences. I've often thought that if you know the thing that you would go for would not be the pleasant. You would, you know, if you were looking at experience, if you were looking at life, you would, and you wanted to have intense experiences, you wouldn't, you know, there's a reason why you would put yourself into a difficult situation because you would have more of the, uh, you know, the emotional gut wrenching stuff is, is just much more intense, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I mean, what, when you look back on your life, I mean, what, uh, what pleasant moments, you know, are there that are really particularly meaningful to you? And it's usually, you know, your big, 
moments of suffering or conquest or your moments of elation or joy. I mean, those are the things that seem monumental to me. It isn't the moments where, well, you know, I was 72 outside. <laughs> <laughs> Woke up at a nice late hour. I mean, just aren't milestones. Yeah. It's true. But the whole idea of potentiality is um, is woven yeah. through this. And, and I think the... – when... oh, sorry, Mary. I was just trying to piggyback on what you were saying because I, I think that you were talking about that before. Uh, and it, it's I think you used the word source at one point, and I think it applies to that idea of original um, potentiality and soul and um, also is connected with Buddhist thought, which I think really pervades – uh, you know, a lot of this. It's interesting. I guess this was about, uh, I don't know if this was maybe a specific time like the 20th century where Buddhism was starting to kind of like widen cracks and, you know, thinking or, I, I mean, I know that, you know, the Beats were, you know, uh, really into it. Um, and Howard, that's, who's you know, obvious. I'm sorry. So let's talk a parallel to him or our predecessor of his, I think, Schopenhauer. Hmm. Yeah. I never wrote that. Nietzsche. Well, was it Nietzsche? One of his. Yeah, well, he, I think he was he, a little upset with him in one thing he said, though. I'm sorry, Daniel. Go ahead. Agree. What were you saying, Nathan? That there was, he was upset with the uh, the author of the Spoke Zarathustra. That uh, I forget which aphorism it is and what his exact beef was, but it's something like he trusted that humans could go that far it's almost like he thought that the um that humanity wasn't doing a very good job of being ubermen <laughs> like there weren't people like up to the game so much um or that he was I i'd like to find that aphorism because he had a criticism of um the kind of spirit being good enough to bring the change that he wanted that it could be a revolution of everything this uh um, this personal spirit, but I think his criticism was that the human spirit wasn't quite so grand in every day, or it didn't um, usually overwhelm in the way that he might have idealized that it could, uh, that it wasn't good enough for the revolution or something. Um, but I, I don't want to get I don't want to get that wrong. I just know that he had a criticism of Nietzsche. Um, well, he does here. Yeah. And go ahead, Daniel. Go ahead. That's all right. No, if you have if you have the passage, please. What? He talks about him. Uh, no, I wasn't talking about a passage regarding Nietzsche. I just this um little aphorism about Aristotle, Aquinas, and Hegel, which he says are three enslavers of the mind. Mm. The worst form of despotism is the system in philosophy and in everything. Mm. There was also something he said. Just if we're pulling out other thinkers that he, you know, had considerations of, was it Plato? I want to, or maybe it was Socrates. He, uh, the aphorism is something like the wis. Uh, he wonders about the wisdom of Socrates, who never wrote down anything. That maybe you ought not to write things down. Uh, another aphorism he had was something like, "What is the point of writing down exactly what you have to say?" Um, and I think calling into question, you know, just his endeavor of you know, what, what's meaningful, you know, why am I, why am I doing this? And, you know, again, going back to that gladiator quote that I really like, you know, he was talking about, so you see him play with, is it all, is it important at all? Or if it's going to be important, it needs to be very important. You need to write for someone who's going to die soon. And these words are powerful. They don't have all day, um, write for, you know, write for now. It gets back to the, the dilemma of consciousness and of chins being most powerful when they're sort of oblique to us, when they come at us askance, because um, <laughs> you say, I mean, he, he, he can't, um, anything that uh, seems to be a foundational sort of uh, myth or belief or anything like that, it just sort of crumbles. And this is, I think he's recognizing along with Nietzsche, you know, that this has happened in our society, but I think uh, of Nietzsche, he's that, you know, so any sort of act of will or, or, or new sort of, um, you know, 
will or, or, or the primacy of it could could uh, save us and people could accomplish being a superman any more than they could accomplish being Christ. I, I found the passage. It's on page 85. It's a little bit long, <clears throat> but I'll read it anyway. Thank you. <laughs> to, a, to a student who wanted to know where I stood with regard to the author of Zarath. Zarathustra. Well, he just says the author is Zarathustra. Yeah. I replied that I had long since stopped reading him. Why? I find him too naive. I hold his enthusiasm, his fervors against him. He demolished so many idols only to replace them with others, a false iconoclast with adolescent aspects and a certain virginity, a certain innocence inherent in his solitary's career. He observed men only from a distance. Had he come closer, he could have neither conceived nor promulgated the Superman, the preposterous, laughable, even grotesque chimera, chimera, sorry, a crochet which could only, which would occur only to a mind without time to age, to know the long, serene disgust of detachment. Marcus Aurelius is much closer to me. Not a moment's hesitation between the lyricism of frenzy and the prose of acceptance. I find more comfort, more hope even, in the weary emperor than in the thundering prophet. This book of aphorisms, I think, is it is very similar uh, to a lot of Nietzsche's work in a lot of ways. So I think there's a little hint yeah. of the, the anxiety of influence there, maybe. Maybe, but maybe also just the, you know, I don't think that it, he never calls on anyone to be a Superman. He, yeah. he never, and I think that the his criticism being that he that that Nietzsche is is being naive or or he was too young to to not realize that he was asking for something of others that he would not that he hadn't gone through the kinds of despair. He's he calls it a solitary's life. If, if you're not going to involve yourself with people and understand what they go through and have your own moments at 3 a.m., then don't give us all shit for it, you know, and, and say that, you know, rather than have our 3 a.m. moments, we should be we should strive to be supermen. Yeah, yeah that was really it, the naivety of it, the not having lived a full life and having the age to consider, you know, some of these positions. Yeah. And what do you do when you are actually faced with moments of terror or ennui or, you know what I mean? Like Mm. having not lived through those or not, not showing evidence of having lived through those, it's difficult to take you seriously if you're asking so much of us. I remember the Robert Solomon course I listened to on Nietzsche, and he was claiming in that course that Nietzsche's life stacked up really well with this philosophy. And I always felt like that was a little, because Saran makes uh, pretty much the opposite claim. He, that, like you're saying, he thinks that uh, Nietzsche didn't, uh, he didn't really have, uh, he didn't really live the philosophy that he, that he propounded. And uh, that seems closer to the truth to me from what I know. You maybe can ask who, who could live that philosophy. Yeah, or maybe in his madness, you know, maybe he achieved it and the result was madness. <laughs> <laughs> we'll <laughs> never know. <laughs> yeah, no, they, Some other... things just work better as writing than <laughs> actually being lived, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Well, later on, he praises Nietzsche uh, just about that. He says that if he died in ecstasy it was a good thing um or that he, he envies him because he probably died in ecstasy um at that moment um which i think is referring to the the horse and all that is that right the man whipping the horse and him jumping the madness and mm-hmm. is that right um that, that's uh, is the story well that was that was when he had his breakdown i think i don't think that was when he died oh well well then i'm not sure of what ecstasy is referring to um well, maybe just the maybe if madness is a kind of ecstasy, you know, if those year, I mean, I don't know who could say. He says uh, in, in an interview here that uh, when asked why he 
quit reading Nietzsche, he says, and it's because of that whole vision of the willpower and all that. He imposed that grandiose vision on himself because he was a pathetic invalid. All his work is an unspeakable megalomania. When, run, when one reads his letters, he wrote at the same time, one sees that he's pitiful and it's very touching, like a character out of Chekhov. I was attached to him in my youth, but n- not later. He's a great writer, though, a great stylist. And he obviously really did value style. He did, you know, he did value the written word. Yeah. Despite his... Yeah, I think in form, he really mimics him a lot. Yeah, I guess I haven't read enough Nietzsche to, to know, to to have uh, made the relation. Yeah, me either. Um, I, I wonder, uh, you know, it's about 2 p.m. and um, then you'll know you uh, have to go soon. Um, so maybe uh, we should uh, uh, take another look at what we got and uh, wind things down. Sure. I'll read the last one. <laughs> I thought we were doing favorite lines, which is probably every line. Yeah, I, I haven't read one that a I did. Favorite, favorite, favorite line. Well, uh, this one well, just strikes me as... Maybe if everybody could go around it, if they had one final one that was just like their favorite one, they could do it. Okay. There was a time when, in order to dispel any impulse of vengeance, once I had endured some affront, I would imagine myself quite still in my grave, and I calmed down at once. We must not despise our, cor- our corpse too much. It can be useful on occasion. <laughs> and I thought about that because I had I, I had been offended by something from a friend and I in that line like I read it at the right time where I had been thinking god why is you know why is this bothering me why is forgiveness difficult why do I feel I need to forgive what you know like all of this stuff and I just thought oh corpse okay corpse okay <laughs> Hey, this is, it's okay. You know, this is a blip. This experience that I'm having right now with this person is a blip. And with my corpse, depending on what you believe, you know, if I were going to actually look back, I will remember the love rather than the slight. I will, you know, I I don't, I don't need to have revenge. I don't even, you know, forgiveness is for anyone. It's for myself focus more on the love than the slight. So it helped. That's a good one. Well, I've got uh, one unless we have a particular order. Oh, it's always my turn. So I'll jump in. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you should start interrupting us more often. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, here it is. This one's short. In major perplexities, try to live as if history were done with and to react like a monster riddled by serenity. I think that, uh, yeah, I think that that's, I've often thought about that, you know, how would, you know, I look, you know, read, you know, fiction or, you know, history, and you see someone in their life, and you're like, why don't you just change everything? Why do you have to all of this? Why don't you just, you know what I mean? Like, why don't you, why are you, why are you doing this? And uh, to just, you know, to think about that, in my, but I don't think about that in my own life. And whenever I do, things start to get a perspective that is helpful. And I think this idea of like, you know, a monster riddled with serenity, it's this kind of surety of will, I guess it's some kind of uh, like, I mean, I'm taking this as some kind of like a, a darker version of don't think too much, just do what you think is right, <laughs> you know, Um that there's yeah. something about uh, proceeding forward. I mean, in major perplexities, uh, if you're if you're about to get lost, this is a way to move forward. And I think it's interesting. I'm not uh, I'm not sure what you know good advice it is to be uh, monstrous, but well, monstrous or corpse, it's <laughs> kind of the same thing, right? If you, you, know, you get to a place where you're well, I like it because it's. That's the thing about this stuff. It's not systematic. So if you're looking for contradictions, you're going to find them. And that's, you know, the answer that, you know, just don't, don't act, uh, just stop and think, or don't think, just go ahead and act. It's like, we all know we could get in trouble either way. And yet you still have to choose. But I mean, he, he just, he brings out, 
you know, he makes, he makes those dilemmas lush, you know, whereas I just stated them very abstractly. I think that there is going from beginning to end, even of a chapter, you can find that. I, I think that he probably had a lot of thoughts about balance, a lot of trouble with balance, with balancing love and hate and, and mm-hmm. despair and joy and action and um, contemplation um, as we all do is, you know, one of the troubles of being born is that you get thrown into this world into humanity and you you have to act and if you don't contemplate then yeah you are a monster i mean isn't that kind of the definition of a sociopath right (laughs) yeah so it's a good recipe when it prevents you from taking some action that would have been uh thought better of Mm-hmm. Planes also very endlessly on how it diffuses action when you might need to act. And, mm. You know, I think that, that diffusing action goes back to the again. I think what his model of consciousness is, which is some kind of like internalized again agitation. And so you know, not punching somebody and being like, nope, hold on. There's a there's an aphorism about that specifically. I think too, where you know, thinking better of your first instinct. And he said something like. No is always in the blood. That I, I can't remember that aphorism, but maybe that rings a bell with you all. No, K N O W. No is always in the blood. Or no, no. N O. So N-O. something like negation. Negation. Yes. Yes. Right. In that there. Uh, don't be afraid to uh, uh, negate because you, there's there's so much. I don't know. It's limitless. You can negate all day. So like, but uh, or something like no is in the blood. And then you can justify it uh, after the fact with rationality, but it comes from a a deep place um, that I I think has to do with being and putting yourself out there. You know, this is another way that uh, action and being are related because actually putting out your potential or saying yes to somebody or uh, those things have a way of encumbering you. Yeah, and no can also be in the blood spilled, you know. Mm-hmm. afterward <laughs> like Ooh, why did i do that yeah you know. here's one that i think really uh it, this is this one is my favorite illustration of of him talking about the same thing that he talks about in a lot of these which is uh ability of the imagination and, and anticipation to uh run through so many iterations in, of different perspectives that you end up losing your personal perspective Um, and defuse action in that kind of way he says filming a scene there are countless takes of the same incident someone watching in the street obviously a provincial can't get over it i'll never go to the movies again unquote one might react similarly with regard to anything whose underside one is seen whose secret on whose secret one is seized yet by obnublation which has something of the miraculous about it there are gynecologists who are attracted to their patients, grave diggers who father children, incurables who lay plans, skeptics who write. I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah, me too. That's really beautiful. I love it. It was also nice to have a read that sends me to the dictionary. Um, <laughs> didn't we have one? What was that? Was it a um... Was it a Nabokov book or something? Was it Pale Fire that we all went to the dictionary yeah. for? Yeah. Mm. Thanks for suggesting this one for a read. It was a nice, uh, refreshing conversation. Wait, yeah. I want to... I think I, I think we have to get Laura's uh, last Well, I, I have to say, uh, there's two things. One, I, that line, I read him for the shipwreck feeling I get from anything he writes. Uh, I just have to say that's my... It, it's up in the top. 10 but there's so many lines that i are i think are amazing it's hard to really but that one really jumped out at me um but there's something i wanted to read that i read in national about him um what does shorin offer us question mark an alternative i would argue to the shuffling and reshuffling of pieties to the superficial investigations of language and politics to the long academic boredom that has settled over philosophy to read Sjorin is to be reminded of another strain in Western culture, one that rejects the progressive ethic of political compromise and social improvement. 
it is customary now to refer to such eruptive and wild-hearted modes of thought, particularly where they coexist with a penetrating intellect, acute criticisms of the liberal political order, and high talent for prose as dangerous. To demean with this label anything touched by the slightest breath of anti-modern sentiment, Shoren's work belongs to the category of the dangerous, and the word applies as both a term of opprobrium and a term of the very highest praise. After all, if philosophy is not dangerous, what purpose can it have? Oh, and I really cool. like that. I really like that analysis of his work. And um, so I wanted to read that. But yeah, it's it's hard to find one line. I Just the shipwreck one really jumps out at me. Thanks. Yeah, that was a great little encapsulation there. Yeah. It yeah. really, I thought it was good. Yes. All right. Well, uh, well I know it wasn't fiction, but um, I, I liked, uh, I just want to say I liked broadening our, our palette here a little bit. Yeah. 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 I'll it's say good. it read as if fiction for, I mean, I, I, w I didn't notice like a, I mean, it was just in keeping with, I think the project, you know, of just like finding good truth and um, good. Yeah. Writing. yeah. And it was never yeah, boring. <laughs> Yeah. I was never boring. I was never bored. Um, could never ever be bored by him. Yeah. Fiction a lot of the time. This one is kind of a uh, fiction and truth, maybe to be yeah. annoyingly pithy about it. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe yeah, lyricism and truth. You know. Yeah. That's that's a, a beautiful thing. 